Hi, I'm Gaurav Agarwal. I'm a psychiatrist and a member of the Center for Workplace Mental Health. I serve as the Chief Wellness Executive for Northwestern Medicine and the Director of Faculty Wellness for Northwestern University. Dean Rungi, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Greetings. Uh, I'm Marshall Rungi. I'm Dean of the University of Michigan Medical School. I'm a cardiologist by training, and I'm also uh, uh, head of the, our, our health system, Michigan Medicine. Great. And uh, I'm Claire Collins. I'm a first year resident at the University of Kentucky. I went to medical school at University of Michigan, and that's actually my hometown. Thank you all for joining us today. And uh, in the interest of, of uh, friendship, I will go with first names moving forward here. Um, we're excited to have you here today and learn a little bit about uh, the program you both uh, helped to usher in at the University of Michigan. Claire, I was wondering if you would tell us a little bit about the medical student mental health program in Michigan that you uh, worked with your colleagues to create as a medical student. Sure, yeah. So it's definitely a dream come true. Uh, and like you and Marshall said, it definitely wasn't just one person effort, but it's something that I've been thinking about for a long time throughout my medical school career. Um, the beginning of thinking about this program was the thought that um, a lot of medical students and residents and physicians have mental health needs. And a lot of the time we don't have the time or space to meet those needs through therapy or psychiatric services. And so we wanted to take a look at what our true needs were at the University of Michigan and come up with some novel ways of meeting those needs. And it ended up being that we saw an opportunity to actually hire uh, specialized um, and dedicated therapists and psych psychiatrists um, to serve the medical students at Michigan. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And, and so uh, you had dedicated mental health providers that were able to, to meet the students where they're at, uh, provide no cost treatment. Is that right? It's great. Yes. And was there also an opt-out program aspect to this uh, that you created? Yeah. So that was one of the unique things we actually um, talked to some of our colleagues at other medical schools about. So within the mental health program, I think of them as having, there's two tiers um, or two sides of it. One is the side where you can request services like therapy and psychiatric services for yourself, as you said, at a no cost to the students. Um, and then the second part is something we are calling M Checks, which is actually an opt out screening program. So anytime anyone gets enrolled in the school, uh, you essentially get automatically enrolled in this M Check and you have to deliberately opt out of it in order not to participate. And in the research we did, it showed that um, participation went up to almost 90% in other programs. That's fantastic. So when we look at the, the research of barriers, you addressed cost, you uh, addressed uh, ease of appointment, and, and it sounds like you're also, through your MCHEC program, addressing this this uh, barrier of stigma. So uh, really the three yeah. core mm -hmm. barriers that, that people have identified in the literature. So, uh, that's brilliant. Uh, Marshall, can you tell us a little bit about your role during uh, this pitch by Claire and her, and her med student colleagues? Well, uh, I, I agree with you when you characterize it as a brilliant approach, because I think it combined all, all those factors that you mentioned, uh, but most importantly addressed what we knew, and as the, is the case at m many medical schools and most of higher education, that we had uh, insufficient resources for our students who had mental health issues, uh, and we, we faced uh, the same challenges, those three big challenges that you noted. Uh, and, and although the university and the, and the medical school had programs, they were insufficient. And we'd, we'd done a lot of talking about it over several years. And I think it was Claire and uh, her leadership and that group that said uh, that they could, they could take a, and, I, and I'll use this term uh, with regard, a, an evidence-based approach to what are the problems, uh, how can those be addressed, and what would really work for, this, for the students. And that needs to come from the students, not from people like me or administration. And so pulling that all together, what made the day for me was 
they said, here's, here's a program we think would work. Here's why. Here's what it addresses. And uh, can you help us make this happen? And uh, it, it is, it was, and it is a very compelling program. And it suits a, a major issue for our medical students. And so that was, uh, I have to say, both one of the most enjoyable uh, and also easiest decisions I've had to make during my tenure here over the last eight years. Uh, that's great context. I think, you know, I, I've had a, the privilege of giving lots of wellness talks uh, across the country um, during my, through my work. And the, the most common question I usually do get asked after these talks is, you know, how does someone on the front lines, how does someone who's a medical student uh, make a pitch to make some of the changes that, to your point, Marshall, people know what they need, but it, it's, it's not clear to a lot of people how they can get the attention of folks like you. So when you tell that story, Marshall, I, I'm, all, I'm just sort of envisioning how does Claire get a meeting with Marshall uh, at that time to, be, to, to even get that pitch? And so uh, I think our audience would really benefit from understanding a little bit of the change management process, the, the, the process of how do you get buy-in, how do you get the attention of leadership uh, when you're on the front lines or a medical student. Um, Claire, any, any tips that you can give, give our audience there of, of the process you took or the allies you built to, to be able to, to secure that meeting with Marshall and, and uh, really have a, a listening ear? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it, it definitely wasn't overnight. Like you said, we had to gain um, you know, allies to really make a compelling story. Um, and so I think the first thing actually I think of is, is our stories. And that's actually how we started our um, written proposal was with stories, um, including my own. And I like to share my own because um, no one is exempt from mental health. Uh, we, we never think of these things, but I struggled with depression and anxiety in medical school. And that actually is one of the things that fueled me to do all of this. Um, so I found peers who were also struggling with this and, and we were there for each other um, and really helped to advocate for each other. Um, and so really just starting small. So just with yourself and, and then finding just the people you work with, honestly, to see what other things are they struggling with? Is it similar? Do they know other people at the institution that are also sharing in these struggles? And from there, we actually went to the broader medical student community and did the same thing. We shared our story and said, is anyone else either interested in this for themselves or want to work on this because they think it's an important thing? And so we started to convene a student group. And from there, we actually worked with Marshall and one of his um, executive deans uh, to, to come up with a proposal for an official work group. And that work group included both students, um, faculty, staff, and then some of the dean leadership in the medical school. Um, and then we also had uh, Dr. Brower, who's the chief wellness officer at the time at, at Michigan Medicine, also help with that work group. And so through that, we were able to have a broad range of people and experience actually sitting at the same virtual table um, to have weekly meetings and start to talk about the real issues at hand. That's fantastic. And I think some of the things I'd love to, to amplify that you said was the power of storytelling, right? I think so often I hear people get obsessed with the business case and the, the money part of it, and all that is incredibly important, but you can't lose the story. You can't lose the moral case mm -hmm. uh, and, and how powerful those things can be. So I think that's great. Marshall, you gave uh, a great point earlier about how the end user's voice has to be a part of these solutions uh, and that it can't be people uh, just at the C-suite level sort of telling people what they need, get, getting that voice and having this, uh, what, what you describe as a working group uh, that's mixed uh, with lots of people that are, are going to be the, the users of the innovation. Uh, sounds like it was very effective for you. All in from when you first started to when it got done, what, what sort, what's the timeline we're, we're talking? Are we talking a, a year, two years, four years? Miraculously, it was about 18 months to, to implementation and funding. So it was, it was pretty quick turnaround, especially in kind of corporate world. Oh, absolutely. That's very, <laughs> very fast. Great. Uh, and I think it is important to remember that is fast, actually. And I think sometimes people get frustrated and, 
and think something can happen in a month, but the, uh, your, your perseverance here of over 18 months is, is really a, a good reminder. Marshall, was there um, anything you can share about, you know, you, you, you highlighted this is not a, a conversation that it was the first time you'd ever heard this is my guess. Uh, was there was there a context that allowed this idea to to really take hold at that time? Uh, uh, besides, obviously, Claire's group sharing their stories. Was there anything else uh, at U of M that that made uh, the timing right to have an intervention occur like this? Um, several things. Um, I, I also want to underscore the importance of stories. Uh, it just makes it makes it real, and uh, so I, I think that's. Um, a foundational aspect, but I would say that uh, Claire and the group were very good, not usually in person even, but in uh, keeping me abreast of what they were thinking, what they were doing. And um, there were, there was a time or two that I would talk to Kirk Brower and say, well, uh, is there something else that I can be do, do to be helpful at this point? And, and usually it was just listening. Um, and so I think, that's good. I think there are another couple of comments I'd make about how to be successful. Uh, I don't have to tell Claire. They, they figured this out on their own. But it's to start small, uh, to build a constituency, uh, to then think about, well, what is that next level? And uh, Claire mentioned that uh, she and the group worked with uh, some of the educational deans. Uh, one that I'd, I'd call out for sure is uh, uh, Aaron uh, McKean, who is uh, assistant dean, I think that's her title, for student services uh, at the medical school. Uh, because with each of those steps, you get, I'm, and I, Claire can say about more, much more about this than I can, but you get some refinement, some input, some thought about how to make that presentation. Um, we often get, uh, at the university level, I have involvement at the university level, often get um, people who are passionate, but they don't have a plan. And 18 months is a is a very rapid time to really come up with a plan. And I think that makes all the difference in uh, convincing somebody like myself that it's a good idea. Um, two other comments I'd make are that even if I had thought of exactly the same, exactly the same plan, uh, it's going to be much more well-received when it comes from peers rather than it comes from you know, somebody sitting at a distance. And so I think that, that, bringing together the medical students is extremely important because if they if they thought, oh, well, this is just another one of those things, uh, no one would have benefited from the program. And I think many people have benefited. The last uh, comment I'll make uh, is, is times and opportunities. Uh, our, the new president of the University of Michigan is Santa Ono, uh, who started in October. Uh, and if you haven't ever heard of him, he's, he's a you know, top tier academic leader, uh, was president of the University of British Columbia before coming to Michigan as president. He himself had significant mental health issues as a younger person. And he talks about it openly. He gave a TED talk about it. And when you can find, when you have that opportunity, um, and in fact, Claire, um, don't be surprised if you hear from the campus because they struggle with this because the the these aren't just problems that people have in medical school. Uh, in fact, maybe it's even broader in uh, on the undergraduate campus. And they struggle with, well, how can we do this? And the, the approach has generally be, been, well, let's throw some more resources. We'll hire some more counselors or we'll hire uh, hotlines and things like that, all of which are important, but they're, they're not the program. Those are the pillars of the program, the support of the program, but it's not the program. So put all that together and I think... Um, we are fortunate to have ended up with a really top tier innovative program to help our students. And that's what's important to us because if we help our students, they'll help our patients. And at the end of the day, we will have accomplished our mission. That's fantastic, Marshall. Thank you for that color uh, on, on the story there. Um, Claire, when you think about, uh, you, you know, your passion and your personal story drove you, I think that comes out loud and clear. Uh, what I hear from people often, especially, you know, again, to us, we know that 18 months is short, but uh, other people can hear that and go, you know, by the time, let's say you started this journey as a second year, 18 months, you're right in the middle of third year where 
as I remember third year med school, there, there's no time for anything, yet alone advocacy, et cetera. What's, what are some tips you might give uh, somebody who's, who's trying to make change on, on how you make time for this? How do you maintain your wellness while trying to improve the wellness of your peers? Any tips there that you might uh, share with us? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so I definitely had a few partners in crime in this, other, other medical students. And uh, some of whom are all over the country now, which is so wonderful. But we would actually set up Zoom dates and work on this face to face. So we couldn't be watching Netflix or other TV shows. Um, and because this was a passion project for us, it, it's something that actually gave us energy rather than take it away from us, even though it was, it was time. And so having kind of a time to work on this, even if it was 30 minutes, uh, at a single sitting was really beneficial and just trying to focus on one thing at a time was really helpful. I would also say I learned very quickly how to run a really good meeting um, <laughs> and I get complimented on it now. And I think it was almost out of necessity and, and from this. And so I, I think, you know, going in with a good agenda about realistically what you're going to get accomplished, knowing that some of the, big picture thinking should not actually happen at those meetings because you have people who whose time is very valuable. And so I think being very diligent about what you're actually going to talk about and having decision making meetings is more important. And then really before leaving that meeting, making sure everyone has a task. And part of my job leading this was to make sure people were accountable for those tasks. I think that's how things got done so quickly because these people are not, you know, sitting, sitting around lazy all day. I mean, they are putting in so much work and this was really an extra meeting for them each week, but we were successful because we each had bite-sized tasks that we could accomplish. And then, so every week we just kept moving closer and closer to really our our big proposal um, that we were able to give to, to Marshall and others at the executive level. Those are fantastic tips and, and how to run an effective meeting uh, is an incredibly valuable skill and, and uh, a skill that I tell people is, is really critical for well-being. They, they, they don't see it sometimes that as a well-being thing, but that's a hugely important well-being strategy for sure. Marshall, I always, you know, we, we I think everyone here on the call uh, is, a, is a mental health advocate. And so we don't really need any other case besides the moral case. But every time uh, these conversations happen about initiatives, uh, the, the conversation always eventually turns to money. Uh, obviously, to be able to provide free mental health care for your students on an ongoing basis uh, is a cost. Uh, how, did you, how did you think about that? And, and how have you um, how would you encourage other leaders who may be on the fence about, hey, is this a, a benefit we can provide? Uh, any tips you might give to other leaders listening to this on how you did it and, and how you might uh, help them think about it if they're, if they're considering it? Um, that, that is a great question and one that's uh, always tough. So uh, a few comments I'd make. Uh, one is when we think about committing to a long-term project like this. It's not a one-time project. We need to ask the question, what is, um, what will the benefit be? And it's, we don't look at that. I don't look at it as return on investment. We're not trying to say, well, we put X amount of dollars into this program and we'll get Y amount of extra work out of people. That That's not the point of this program. Uh, but the return is, uh, in the health of our students. And just as, you know, maybe 50 years ago, students wouldn't have a health plan. Um, how could we imagine in today's world students not having a uh, the necessity and the opportunity in a non-stigmatized way to uh, gain mental health services that are needed? So it's it's a little different than that you have a health plan. If you get sick, you go to the um, emergency room or you see a physician. Um, but I think what what has been lacking is uh, an approach that makes sense. Now, if, if, the, if the proposal had come in that we want to spend a million dollars a year and we're going to do this and that, uh, that would have been a bigger 
um, bigger point to consider. But this this was really really well balanced. And I think the other thing that I'd have to say uh, to my peers, although I don't think this is a hard sell for most of my peers, is it's not an either or. You don't have to say, okay, well, if we do this, we won't be able to do that. Um, if we do this, we're not going to be able to uh, afford to have the, the adequate, but no more than that gym that we have for the students. I don't know if Claire ever used that gym mm-hmm. or not, but adequate is what I'd call it. Um, but but um, you know, as a leader, you have to decide, well, if it's important, we have to find the money to do it somehow. And we shouldn't find that money by taking away from other important programs. Um, and so we, we, did, uh, we did find the money. Uh, one, one advantage in our system is we are very tightly uh, linked to our health system. And uh, so our health system has resources. And in fact, at the end of the day, uh, both of those report to me. So on the health system scale, this is not a lot of money. And so we just needed to figure out how do we make that work? So I, I would encourage, I, I feel like I'm rambling here, but what I would encourage is that um, my colleagues who uh, are thinking about this, uh, this program has, I think, has and will continue to be transformational for our students. And there's nothing that is more important to our students than being, being able to learn during these critical four years of their uh, lives uh, before they go on to internships and residencies. Uh, there, there is a great deal of uh, data that uh, Claire and her colleagues did present some of, uh, just talking about the stress of being a medical student, the rates of depression as they go up from year one to year two to year three, some, some of which was done by one of our uh, psychiatrists. Uh, some of these studies were done by one of our psychiatrists. And um, so, so I think bringing data, bringing stories, um, that's what that's what sells it. I would also, if, if you don't mind adding, I, I you know, um, I I wasn't there on the back end, you know, Marshall, when you guys were trying to actually figure out where the finances were coming from. But as you noted, we did actually do part of the research because at the end of the day, things won't run without money. Um, and so that's you know not a motivation for any of us here, but it is a reality. And so I think thinking about things in those terms is important because making sure that we've thought through how much this is going to cost and the alternatives to this is very important. And some of what we did do research on was, you know, we, we know that medical students go on to be residents and attendings and deans and all these things that have ripple effects. And so thinking about creating truly well future physicians actually has such a huge impact, not only, you know, of course, financially, but in the kind of bigger world picture. And so I wouldn't downplay the importance of at least having a section of a proposal saying that you really thought about the finances and maybe you don't have the solutions, but here's what you kind of figured out. I, I couldn't possibly say it better than that. that that's perfect. Um, I think it's also, um, this is a long-term research project in a sense, but when uh, it's possible to look at uh, morale uh, and depression before and after such a program, uh, we have too many students who get disillusioned uh, during medical school. Some some leave medicine altogether. Others think, well, I'll use my degree to do something different. Not that that's bad, but um, when they do it as a result of being uh, just uh, having difficulty coping with the many stresses of medical school, that, that is a loss. And uh, we, like other places, have had um, the horrific uh, problem of students and house staff who did take their own lives. And there's no way to put a dollar on that, but that, that is devastating. It's devastating to the students. It's devastating to the faculty. It's devastating to the families. And, you know, thankfully that's a rare occurrence, but we don't want it. We want it to be a zero occurrence. Mm -hmm. Um, And if with, with, particularly with the uh, opt out program, I think uh, that, that is one of the best ideas I've ever heard of in terms of people having, having a no stigma opportunity to see somebody and have a talk and, and 
do that before they're at the absolute end of their rope. Well, it, it's really an inspiring partnership, uh, the way you all work together, uh, Marshall, your leadership uh, and your uh, humility to be able to meet with anyone uh, that has a good idea is is inspiring and I think a great lesson for us. And obviously, Claire, uh, you know, your efforts, your passion uh, to be able to, to do this during medical school when I was just trying to keep my head above water is uh, <laughs> is is beyond impressive. And, and uh, we really appreciate you all taking the uh, additional time now to talk with us and share your story and, and hopefully uh, encourage others around the country to, to take action and, and uh, provide access to mental health care uh, to uh, our medical students and, and all our health care providers. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I do want to encourage anyone, you know, to reach out to colleagues like myself or others on the call. This is not something you have to do alone. Thank you so much.